Hey class, so some of you had a question about workshop problem number five, so I thought I'd go ahead and give you guys uh, a video about it. So, let's see what we got going on. There's really three parts to this question. Alright, so part A asks us if the spring were compressed and propelled the block forward, how far up the ramp would it go if it were frictionless? Part B then asks the same question if it had friction, and then part C asks us in the frictional case from part B, if the block were then to return sliding down the ramp, what would its speed be when it got to the bottom of the ramp? So to do this, let's think about the different points in time we have. So let's call this point 1 when we start. We'll call point 2 up here, and then point 3 will be when the block returns back to the bottom, which will only be used in part C. All right, so let's think about what kinds of energy we have at each location. All right, so at point, a, point one, all we have is elastic potential energy, right? As you can see, we're given the K value, which is, let me find it in the problem, 1,800 newtons per meter. We're given the X value, initial, or X sub 1 is what I'll call it, and that is a distance of 0 0.23 meters, that's its compression, and we're also given, just so we know, this angle theta here is given to us. Okay, so that's what's going on at point one. At point one, the kinetic energy equals zero. All right, then we got point two, okay. So at point two, this is when it has stopped, and so again, our kinetic energy is still zero, that's nice. Our potential energy elastic is zero, but now we have gravitational potential energy, which is going to be equal to mgh. Now the question is, what is h? Well, if we look over here, this distance here is h. And that's different than what we're asked to determine, which is the distance up the ramp. So I'll go ahead and label the distance up the ramp. We'll call that d. Okay. So that's what we got going on here. Interesting, sounds good. If we want, we can go back up to point one and just label that our gravitational potential energy at point one is zero if we call the ground our zero location. Maybe I'll put subscripts in here so we don't get confused. And then we'll talk about point three a little bit later, but it's returning down to the ground so you can see it's just gonna have kinetic energy. All right, so let's go ahead and look at what we would do to solve. So starting with part A, we're going to use the work energy, uh, conservation of energy equation. So our kinetic energy at point 1 plus any potential energy at point 1 plus any work that is done by non-conservative forces will be equal to our final energy. So kinetic energy at point 2. Let's uh, shift over. I'm using... you. Oh, ha! I'm using some new... Uh, software for the first time. So apparently the blocks don't want to move with me when I move the screen. That's interesting. Okay, cool. So we'll do... Actually, maybe I'll try something else. Let's try this. Zoom out just a little bit. Okay, now we have room, and sorry about that, but anyway. Then we have plus our potential energy at point two. Cool. So we can substitute in now. We've already observed that our kinetic energy 1 is 0, our kinetic energy 2 is 0, and so our potential energy 1 is going to be the energy due to elastic potential. So we have U elastic. And then what about work done by non-conservative forces? Well, in part A, since friction is 0, that is 0 as well. Oh, let's use red to cross it out. So you just have U elastic, and then what does that turn into? Well, at point two, all we have is U gravitational. So that looks easy enough to me. We have one half K X one squared is equal to M G H, right? And what is H? That's a good question to ask. Let's get a new color to do H, maybe green. So H, if we draw our diagram here, this is D, this is H, and this is our angle theta. So you should be able to observe that, <laughs> I don't know why those squares don't move, sorry about that. 
Um, so you can observe from this drawing that the sine of the angle, theta, will just be equal to opposite over hypotenuse, or h over d. So you can observe that h is just going to be equal to, let's give ourselves some more room here. <laughs> oh, I see. Apparently these items move independently. Anyway, sorry about that. So h is going to be equal to d times the sine of the angle theta. Okay? So you should be able to plug that in and solve for d, since d is what we're asked to determine. Okay? Oh, I see. Anyway. Now I can move the blocks now that they're out of place. So, I hope that helps there. Let's just look briefly, since this video is getting long, at part B. So part B, you're going to be using the same equation, right? Kinetic energy 1 plus potential energy 1 plus work done by non-conservative forces must be equal to kinetic energy 2 plus potential energy 2. Right? And we have observed that kinetic energy 1 and 2 are both 0, but now work done by non-conservative forces is not 0. Okay, So let's try to figure out what's going on there. So our potential energy that we start with is the same, U elastic 1. Now we have work done by non-conservative forces, which is going to be negative work done by friction, which will be equal to the friction force multiplied by that d distance, and that's going to be equal to u gravitational. That's, sorry, u gravitational at point 2. Okay, so you need to find what the force of friction is, keeping in mind that force of friction is equal to mu times the normal force. But in this case, the normal force, because it's on a ramp, is not just mg, so be careful there. Okay, but you should be able to, from here, go ahead and solve for that d value, because you're going to have, again, 1 half k x1 squared minus that force of friction, which I'm going to leave to you to find, multiplied by d, is going to be equal to mgh, which is d sine theta. So here, again, you can see there's d and there's d. You can solve that equation. Up here in part A, you make the substitution with H to be able to solve for D there. And then in the last equation, for the last part, you're going to need to, once again, look at what happens from point 1 all the way back to point 3. All right? So I know the video is getting long, but you guys love these videos so much, I'm sure. So <laughs> I'll just quickly talk about point C, or part C. So in part C, once again, we have... KE at point 1 plus PE at point 1 plus work done by non-conservative forces is going to be equal to KE2 plus PE2. And once again, well not once again, but this time again we see KE1 is 0. Oh, let me, really these aren't point 2. This is the new point that we've called point 3, right? Okay, so at point 3, it's returned to the ground, so its potential energy at point 3 is 0, and it just has its velocity, so its only energy it has is kinetic energy. So the question then is, what types of energy are we dealing with here? Well, we have the same starting energy, 1 half kx1 squared. That hasn't changed. But now, what is work done? Well, work is force times distance, force of friction, what's the distance? Well, now it goes up the ramp, all right? If we think about our picture, remember that the distance d was the distance that it makes it up when there's friction happening, which we already found in part b, or hopefully you will have found by this point. So what distance does it travel? Well, the block goes up, d stops, turns back around, and gets to the bottom. Whoa, it traveled a distance of 2d. So the work done is friction multiplied by 2d, both on the way up and the way down. Friction will be opposing the displacement. So that becomes easy enough. And then your final energy, 1 half mv at point 3 wow. squared. So you can go ahead now. This d value is the box where the answer you're going to get from part b. All right, that's the same d, and so you should be able to solve. I hope that helps. Let me know if you have additional questions.